So today is an interesting topic, isn't it? Some people may think, what a stupid question. <laughs> Other people may say, at last somebody is talking about my topic, my favorite topic, and I am a Buddhist. <laughs> Well, whether it's stupid or not, I actually wrote it down, the list of, it's all my fault, in other words, that you have, we are on this topic. And I didn't think, you know, when we start, before we uh, decide the Sunday public talk, we have a blank sheet, which is offered to the community to write down titles. So I wrote three titles. And the last one was this one, and I just wrote it in jest, really. And I was thinking recently, why did I write this interesting? Why did I come through, the, you know, wrote this topic in that, uh, through, under that angle? And it reminded me of my young age, you know, when we used to have Woody Allen and, you know, everything you want to know about sex, but never they are asking. So it's like maybe it came from everything you want to know about falling in love as a Buddhist monks or nuns, only people, but never dare asking, you know, how can I be a, a true Buddhist and fall in love? That might be a question you will never dare asking to maybe a teacher, or a Buddhist teacher. So in any case, um, it uh, came through remembering a friend of mine who was a monk for a number of years, and when we had a casual conversation with a group of friends, he said, you know, he was a monk for quite a long time. He said, gosh, as a monk, I always fell in love. Now, he's not here, not even in this country, and you'll never know who he is. But <laughs> that was interesting, even for me. I never thought it was a big thing to fall in love, you know, as a Buddhist. But I remember having what? That must have been a struggle for this monk, you know. And so I thought that's an interesting topic to just kind of uh, uh, reflect upon, okay? So um, it's, I have to admit, it's not a big problem for me in terms of falling in love with somebody, a person, but you can fall in love with many things, you know, with the country, with the sunshine of today, with uh, something that makes you happy, that you like that makes your emotional world very happy. So it's not just a person, but just this feeling, you know, falling in love, oh. Makes you so kind of, so special. It's like a rebirth, it's like something new, isn't it? Something new. But then people forget very quickly, so they keep falling in love. <laughs> and they think it's always new, of course. They forget the consequences of having followed this feeling, this lovely feeling. What we call cause and effect, like karma, you know. So one of the uh, wisdom aspects of the Buddhist teaching is to develop and cultivate the, what we call in Buddhism, the citta, in such a way that it is, it, it is transformed into an, a world that is very bright and awake and has the ability to use the six senses in the best possible way. Now, for a long, long time, we, most of us don't even know we have a mind. Have you noticed? Of course, nowadays, we speak so much about Buddhism, mindfulness, mindfulness stress reduction, and all these sort of things, so we are a bit more familiar with the term being awake, being mindful, being, um, you know, making the mind bright, happy, and so on. Knowing that the source of our world has a very clear beginning, which for a long time perhaps we imagined this beginning of our world was somewhere outside us, was caused by external conditions caused by people, by my mother, by my father, by my partner, and so on. For a long, long time, we are completely convinced 
that my world is out there somewhere, not far from me, but not here. Not. And then when we actually begin to walk the path of practice or meditation, then what happened is that, oh, we discover a whole universe in there that sometimes we find incredibly pleasant when the mind is calm and peaceful and or joyful. Or, and at the other time, we are shocked by the amount of pain and hurt and misery that has been accumulated for so long, perhaps. Especially if we never really looked into our mind, we might be a bit shocked, surprised that this is all going on very often, 90% of the time, without really any conscious knowledge of that. You know? Then we feel miserable. And people will say, well, what's going on in your mind? Have you ever known what you're thinking right now, what you're feeling? What, you are, what are your emotions? You know, are you happy? So, you know, in, there is a whole aspect of psychology. And there's a huge amount of research about falling in love. You know, I had a little bit of my personal study on this. You know, and you can see how um, most of what people talk about, this topic of love and falling in love, has to do with the, the kind of um, describing the symptoms. Very rarely have I found somebody or teaching, or whether it's science, whether it's psychology, whether it's um, you know a, a, you know a topic which is not necessarily Buddhist. Wh wherever I find it, it's very rarely it's actually talking about the real cause of this falling in love. And then what happens is the mind tends to judge. The mind naturally has a capacity, endless capacity to judge itself. So, if you're a Buddhist and you do something that is not Buddhist, what happens? You start beating yourself up, thinking you've lost the past, you should have been much better Buddhist, you shouldn't have been a good person, like the Buddha says, do good, refrain from doing evil and purify your heart. These are the teachings of the, all the Buddhas. So, the mind has a capacity to be really uh, the compound delusion, to accumulate the troubles that we already have in place and have to deal with. So instead of judging, what can we do? Is that, have, you ever, have you ever asked yourself, can I move forward without judging myself? Can I transform my mind without judging and criticizing myself? Can I be myself without being a judge of myself? Right? So, when we, you bring this topic, like falling in love, um, you know, many people know that when you fall in love, whether it's with a Buddhist teaching or, or a person, or you fall in love with the idea of becoming a nun or a monk, you know, it so feels so wonderful. Oh, if only I was a monk or a nun, my life would be finally resolved. I would have no problem. Well, I invite you to come to Marawati and to just experience it for yourself. See what happens. You always bring yourself with yourself. You don't get away from your mind so easily, unfortunately. Although we tried really hard to look somewhere else. We try very hard to distract ourselves. We try very hard to, um, you know, accuse other people to be our problems. So. Uh, we have a huge amount of means to stay away from what is real and true. We have developed the skill of being deluded to its ultimate level. But we don't have to judge that. It's not a judgment. Immediately, you might think, oh, this is terrible, you know. Ajahn Sundar is saying the ultimate skills or means to be deluded. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that unbeknown to us, until we wake up, until we look inside, until we explore our mind, and until we have some realization, some insight into the way it works. It's very difficult to actually be at peace with it. You cannot find peace until you, are, you understand 
All the great sages have said the same thing. And perhaps that's what attracted me most to Buddhism is the fact that you, do, you did have to use your brain and you had to use your uh, you know, cognitive faculty and your understanding capacity to come to understand what is a path of liberation. Because it's just word, the path of liberation, just concept, ideas, very abstract, isn't it? But the path itself is all about experiencing, seeing for oneself, it's all about uh, knowing for oneself. It's not about dogma. It's not about the idea that we have to conform to a particular image or conform to a particular teaching even. It's not that. And I love the teaching of Lumpo Sumedu when he says, you know, we're not here to be saint. We are here to be, we're not here to be saint. We, we are here to see the way things are. Because when you see the way things are, then you see the Dhamma. Right? When you see the way things are, you see the Dhamma. Now these are, again, if the experience is not um, uh, enabling you to integrate those, this, this conceptual knowledge, it's like, it doesn't get you anywhere. It's just feel more confused. At least before I started Buddhism, you might say, at least I knew I had a problem. Now, I don't even know if I had one or not, and I'm confused. <laughs> I don't know where to turn. Shall I be a Buddhist? Shall I be a Sufi? Shall I be a Christian? Shall I be nothing, an atheist? And that's quite fashionable nowadays, isn't it? Uh, basically, believing nothing. We, we haven't believed anything for a long, long time, but we never called it atheist. Now it's a big word, it's kind of quite, not fashionable, but I know many people will be very happy to call themselves atheist. So to go back to love and falling in love, I haven't forgotten it, don't worry, well, we'll, we'll, turn, we'll turn around the subject for a while, right? So the symptoms, it's, it's wonderful, the psychological aspect of this topic, you can go, no wonder people get lost, you know, because they just kind of maybe finding out, you know, what are the symptoms, how does, does this person love me, loves me, or does she not love me, you know, what, and then you can go, you know, on the psychological level, what do they do, you have a huge study on this, you know, is, is there, does that person did that, and did, she looked like, she looked like this, he looked like that, or, you know, was I thinking too much about this person, am I obsessed now with this person, right, some people can recognize themselves, can you, <laughs> You know, as they, uh, the, you have all the kind of description of falling in love, you know. They don't tell you what happened when the law of Anicca strike, impermanence. You know, the Buddha said everything is impermanent, everything changes. But for some reason, when you fall in love, you never get that truth, do you? It's falling in love goes well together forever. Emotionally speaking, you never want that feeling to go, do you? Do you? That's right. So that's the ultimate delusion, isn't it? Everybody's been practicing meditation, done retreat, and, so, and still you want this falling in love never to go. So I need a bridge. You know, maybe I can help with a little bridge, you know, bring a little bridge between what we you know, imagine to be and the reality of it is quite different. This is why it's worth talking about it, because it's a feeling that has brought dramas upon dramas, murders, uh, you know, people killing each other because they fall in love and the other one didn't fall in love, because one was happy to fall in love and the other one ran away to escape the person wanting to fall in love with them, you know, and then falling in love also has an end. You know, all the things about, all the good things. That my teacher used to say, yeah, when you fall in love, it's like even all the pimple and the, and, and the warts of your partner looks really sweet and pretty. You know, because you can't see. You can't see. You just see the beauty of it. You know, falling in love has to do also with seeing beauty. You don't fall in love with an old crumpled old ladies or a handicapped old man or, you know, you don't, that, that feeling doesn't come naturally unless you're very advanced. 
what I mean, it's a mature love then. It's not falling in love. It's a mature, it's a, what the Buddha talks about. It's like a love that is, um, is compassion. It's more like a love that describes compassion. And so, are you okay? No, it's all right, don't worry. It's fine, I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay. Thank you. Got the biggest muscles. <laughs> so, through not understanding this particular theme of our life, you can see that newspapers sell well. Have you noticed that? Newspapers are all about fell in love, fell out of love. So many stories are about this particular theme. And it's become very tiring to hear all these stories about falling in love, out of love, in love, out of love, new love, out of love. It's kind of sickening sometimes for some of us. <laughs> Mostly because um, there is no really a solution to this particular experience. There's not a, you know, a recipe for what to do with falling in love. My perspective on this will come from my experience of the Buddhist path. And of course, as a samana and a brahmacharya, you might say, oh, of course, this nun probably never fall in love, you know. Well, I've learned my lesson, fortunately, before I was a nun. And so um, I was very clear <laughs> that this particular feeling was not my way of life. <laughs> but you have to be, um, you know, you have to be very careful when you have a lot of ideas about things, including Buddhist ideas, right? Including Buddhist ideals, ideas, you know, and trying to implement them in the reality of your daily life or daily experience or personal experience. Because life has nothing to do with ideals and ideas, you know. Ideas, as you've been told many times, it's like a pointer, a pointer to London. It's a, an arrow that takes you to London on the M25. But the experience of the M25 is very different from seeing you. London is one hour down the M25. If you have been down the M25, you know that that nice sentence, say, in a cool piece of Amarawati on a sunny day, is quite different from the M25 at 8 o'clock in the morning. You can't, that the reality cannot be captured in one sentence. Yes, like falling in love cannot be captured in, in one sentence, the experience of that cannot be translated in the experience itself. So you read things, you know, falling in love, it's like, oh, falling in love at first sight, you know. Lots of story about that. You just hope that the other person has got the message, <laughs> got the transmission, you know, it's like, whoops. Oh dear, no, dear, no, no, it's me, me only. <laughs> but there's a huge amount of literature on this proliferation of related to that experience, you know. So from the Buddhist point of view, it's the things that, I mean, the Buddha was the ultimate compassionate teacher as far as I'm concerned. You know? He did make life a lot of fun, particularly, but he made life, an ex you know, a possibility of continuous joy, and compassion. Now, that might not be exactly the, the feeling that you want to explore for the rest of your life, but as far as I'm concerned, this is much more satisfactory for somebody who is on the path of liberation that discovering whether I need to fall in love or not. I'm much more interested actually in noticing what happened when I, when I notice when the mind is obsessed with one person or even one addiction, one particular thing that you love, love, you know. I fall in love with France, or I fall in love with good wines, or I fall in love with this region, you know, or that place. Uh, we can, this, is, this expression is used for many things, you know, it's not just people, yeah? Maybe in England it's less so, but in French, in France, you know, people are really quite happy 
to talk about, to talk about falling in love with anything, you know. It's not a, it's not a stigma. Yeah, we can express our we can express our feelings without being rude. <laughs> it's, it's part of the culture. But you know, I understand when I was kind of uh, kind of reflecting on this topic, and I realized that in France we have from the I think don't get me wrong, but I think 12th or 13th century, and I can't remember the exact century, and I didn't look into this. We have a whole, you know, the, the, the aspect of love in, in the French culture is very different from, I don't know other countries, I know England very well, and I've been to Germany, I don't know the culture as deeply as I know English culture and French. But certainly, in the French culture, there is a, a, um, a kind of... Um, a perspective on the feeling of love, which is very different from this culture, for example. Because it's not just love, it's actually any of the sensory experience in France is seen as something, uh, not only it's not bad, but it can be totally, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you call that? Um, um, it, it becomes something beautiful, you know. Like you're doing beautiful wine, f beautiful food, Having sex is, is is beautiful in France, you know. Even the pre French president doesn't mind being caught up with a little scooter and a hamlet on his head on his way to the second mistress. You know, it's like oh, forgive him. You know, he, he's kind of he's stressed out. You know, you know. I just heard that Mitterrand, Mitterrand had a Mitterrand and Chirac. I was re reading some of their life story. Goodness me, I mean, this guy. You know, every time they invited a journalist, well, you know what happened. Well, but nobody, nobody ever knew ever knew about these things, you know. But they had a little fling, you know, little stories going on in the background. But beside this, you know, more gross level, <laughs> there there is also a culture of love which is very poetical. We had, for example, the troubadours. I don't know if anybody has studies French literature, but we had the troubadours, and the troubadours. It's a whole kind of. A, um, <laughs> You know, it's a whole movement of of describing the longing for something. You know, longing. Never mind if you never have what you long for, but longing. And very often, the object of this longing was this little princess at the top of a dungeon somewhere on a castle in France, somewhere. And the troubadour will go to war, do something. I don't know what they did, but they went away traveling and singing and writing poetry and so on. And this longing for the beloved, you know, seemed to be a very beautiful, poetical, and very dignified and noble feeling. Do you understand? So that's why the French get into an awful lot of trouble with love, because they haven't seen the full noble truth yet. They haven't seen, haven't, haven't kind of translated clearly into dukkha in the end of dukkha. Yeah, that doesn't, that wouldn't go down very well, except those who have awakened a little bit and have practicing the teaching of the Buddha. The teaching of the Buddha can deflate a lot, a lot of dreams, you know, because a lot of our dreams are quite un unreal, and we love our dreams, the possibility of one day doing what I want. Or... So that goes together with this longing for wanting something we haven't got yet, you know. Now the Buddha is much more pragmatic and compassionate. He said, "Don't worry, just get down to the real. Go down to you know, get down to the real thing. Uh, observe what happened when you fall in love. You know, he's not asking you to say love is terrible. You know, just look at the women or man. Remember, it's just a skeleton inside. Bowels, heart, kidneys. You know, the thirty-two parts. Is it?" It's a chant we do in the morning, describing the inside of the body, called the unbeautiful aspect of the body. So you can't just kind of go to your beloved kind of object over there and just, you know, in Thailand, the monks are kind of uh, are encouraged to look at the unbeautiful side of the body. Just like the nuns, we chant this regularly. But you know, for us Westerners, we are really funny. When I look at my, when I think about my liver, I think it's quite pretty. When I, I saw a liver once, you know, an image, you know, the inside of our body is not that bad for Westerners, because we looked at science and we saw inside what was inside, and we, you know, why would we have a would we have a judgment over 
the, 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 what's going on in your body, in your, you know, except a certain aspect, rather not go into it for too long, you know, but blood and saliva and, you know, brains and so on. So when we, um, you know, when we look at uh, this particular teaching is actually to counteract the tendencies of our habits to be fascinated by what is beautiful, even when it's not beautiful, but we are, something in us can actually uh, put a filter of beauty, you know, that shows something outside beautiful because we are enamored with that thing or with that person. The feeling of love is here and falling in love is here. And we are looking for somebody, basically, on which this feeling can be dumped onto, you know, or rest onto, sorry, or catch somebody's attention. But actually, it's all begin here. You know, when I look at, uh, I don't know, when I look at a worm, I never have this feeling. I just have compassion. I have a lot of compassion for animals and, you know, but the falling, falling in love with a worm just would not cross my mind. Falling in love with a person I don't find beautiful or handsome wouldn't, wouldn't bring up this kind of message, you know, that would fill up my mind and body to the point where I felt totally impassioned or, you know, obsessed with this person, wanting to be close to that person, wanting to think about this person all the time, you know. I noticed you don't have to fall in love to experience these things. It's just like somebody is interesting for you and you don't, uh, you don't know how to let it go. And you can actually, your mind can be thinking about the same person all the time. You notice that? Is that, is that fun to do this? For me, it was clear, like 30 years ago. No way. I don't want to have my mind bogged down with the image of somebody when I know the clarity and the beauty and the joy of, an, of a peaceful mind. It's like you don't want to, to do that to your mind. For one thing, because it makes your mind, instead of realizing that the mind is vast, you just have a little thought and a little image of someone or something that is basically putting your chitta in a box. Do you understand? You are in a box. Instead of having the open sky view, you have a little box there and you keep thinking and recreating and recreating. We do the same with most things. You know, if we are anger, angry, if we are uh, you know, upset with somebody, you noticed. It's not just falling in love. If falling in anger, that also can happen, can't it? When we f think of somebody and keep, you know, repeating the same old story, the same, he did this, she did that, he did this, and he did that, and da da da, go on and on all day in different form, different sentence, different adjective, different different language. Sometimes, I used to have a dad who used to swear in German, so we never hear it. I don't know if he thought in German as well. He was French. He studied German before Second World War, don't worry. <laughs> so, um, you know, what do we do with this feeling? Well, we just, it's so reassuring that what the teaching is requiring is a real interest in exploring experience rather than dreaming something that is completely disconnected with reality. It, that requires a real honesty, a real integrity, and more than that, you know, it, it, it requires a, a, a real interest in seeing for oneself what everybody's talking about. Now, you don't have to go out from here and start falling in love just to make sure that you know what Ajahn Sundar was talking about. You know, it's not that, I'm not saying that, right? <laughs> but, um, basically, to um, explore through meditation, through just awareness that comes whilst you call, you're practicing meditation, you are you have this extraordinary opportunity to actually look at yourself directly. Isn't it amazing? You can look at your soul directly. You can look at your feeling. You don't have to believe anybody. You can look at your body directly. You can, you know, when you, are, when you have this loving feeling, like, you know, it's 
kind of sudden kind of hit there, you can actually explore that. You don't have to believe it straight away. Within five minutes, it might be gone. Now, if you were not practicing, because you don't know how to let go, you haven't trained your mind to let go, you don't know to letting go, and because of that, without you having any choice, you, you carry it around on your shoulders for days, for months, for years sometimes, you know, because you haven't trained your mind to learn how to let go. It's a big learning. It doesn't happen by itself, even though nowadays, in terms of immediate practice, when somebody teaches meditation, you know, you are being told, um, sit comfortably, uh, cross your leg, uh, pull your chin slightly back, make sure your back is upright, and remember, there's nowhere to go, nothing to become, just here, now. So that's, I can hear, almost all of us came into the present moment, just there's a feeling like suddenly everything went really quiet. Did you notice that? Amazing, isn't it? Just a group going quiet. It's like, hit you. Something. But the actual work that we need to do to enable ourselves to come to that place of quietness and peace, not just when the mind is quiet and peaceful, but quietness and peace when the mind is also turbulent. And the mind is not just your little brain here. The mind is all your experience in the here and now. In the experience could be feeling sad, feeling regretful, feeling what's next, feeling, oh dear, why did I come here today? Feeling, um, I forgot this, oh, I didn't do that, how awful this person is, or whatever. Just your experience. So what the, the Buddhist teaching is helping you to develop a kind of microscope, you know, a, 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 an, an instrument that can look in great details to what your life is about. So when, you know, from that vision, once you see clearly what's going on, then you realize that judging is not at all necessary, not only that, but you can make it redundant. There's a different way to sort out things than just attacking oneself with a critical mind. There's another way, there are many other ways. Unfortunately, most people, you know, even not long ago, somebody was doing something that he did not like, but he could not stop it. And unfortunately, I could see this person kept, this is a stupid thing I do, this thing is ridiculous, I shouldn't be doing that, you know, it's really bad, I know that, but I can't help stop doing it, you know. You see the difference between uh, what we know and what we can do, or can know ourselves through experience. That's the hardest part. You know, the conceit of knowing everything in our brain is very strong. So there's a sense of not wanting to do the work that is necessary, because I know this already. I've read 20 books on that, I know it, I know it. As I said, you don't need to remind me, I only know it that. But I'm not here to add more to your, um, you know, your intellectual knowledge, your conceptual knowledge, but more I'm hoping that can encourage you to actually go down and do the work get down into your body and do the work. So um, falling in love is not forbidden in Buddhism. It's what is encouraged and described in the teaching of the Buddha is just to be wise with any experience you go through. Wise. Is this experience leading me to being coming a, a better person? Is this experience increasing my sense of joy and happiness in me? Is this experience making me more generous, more open to life, more relaxed? Or is it leading me in opposite direction? Miserable, unjoyful, unbeautiful, mean, don't want to know anybody, don't want to give anything, don't want to talk to anyone, me, 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 first. 
So this is very important to realize that the uh, falling in love is not written in any sutta that falling in love is forbidden. But the, the suttas describe very clearly the many aspects of the path, noble eightfold paths, through stories, through anecdotes, through examples, and so on, described very well. You know. So, for example, um, is this act of falling in love, is, does that make me unethical? Because maybe the person opposite me might not have any interest in myself. You know. Or are you so obsessed with the desire to be seen, to be heard, to be recognized by somebody, because you can't do it yourself? You can't hear yourself, maybe you can't recognize this person here, you can't, you're not connected in yourself. Then you feel the need to be to connecting with somebody who perhaps will help you to connect yourself. You don't know. It might be a positive experience. Right? So is my experience of falling in love leading me towards that a sense of greater well-being and greater self, a sense of uh, self-confidence, a sense of um, you know, compassion and loving kindness, and so on? Or is it, as I repeat, making me more angry, more impatient, more selfish, and a whole long list of things that we call akusala or, you know, unbeautifully mind, mind state. Yeah. <clears throat> so much suffering comes out of being rejected from a loved one, being unaccepted by somebody who you feel you would love to be accepted by, you know, so much, so much pain is gen generated by the fact that uh, falling in love might not be a reciprocal, <laughs> one. Then two, uh, experience of the two weeks you fall in love might not be as good as you thought after two or three weeks, you know. Because it does has, you know, a moment of, ah, oh, wonderful, and then, oh dear, and then, oh no, if I'd known, you know, it's unfortunate that things do change. <laughs> I mean, personally, for me, it's very fortunate that things do change. You know, I'm really glad that we don't have to hang on to anything. Because that's where freedom lies, do you understand? Hanging out to anything is not freedom. Hanging out to anything is your chains and your prison, you know, both at the same time. So um, when, you know, when you have this feeling of falling in love, when I was thinking at the first time, I thought, it's just a feeling. I mean, as a Buddhist myself, having practiced for so long with Vedana, you know, the feeling, the emotion, the sensation in the body, all that covers the range of, it's not exactly, Vedana means many things in a way. It's a physical feeling, mental feelings, and so on. Sensation in the body, and it's all include all that, yeah? So I can begin to read my mind and my body to inform me about the reality of my life now is perhaps not romantic, you know, not very romantic to not be able to kind of project and dream and imagine all kinds of things that could happen one day. You know, it's not as romantic as that. It's just telling you it's all impermanent. It's not yours. Don't hang on to it because it's going to go any minute unless you cling to it and stress yourself for hours and days and weeks and years to hold on to something, right? And it's, um, yeah, it's not self, it's impermanent and it's painful, isn't it? 
Look at the freedom of your mind for those of you who've done the uh, retreats here. Do you remember the last day before you go back to the great, uh, the great real world, you know? If you remember, you come out of retreat, you look that radiant and absolutely wonderfully free from all troubles. You're walking on a little cloud of peace and self-compassion and love and does that last? Have you noticed? Does that last a long time? Yeah? Yeah? Not much, eh? It lasts about a few hours, you know? I mean, I cannot see Anagarika. Go back to the nuns area, you know? It's, oh, dear. Actually, actually, we do talk a lot on retreats. So it doesn't change that much from one thing to another. <laughs> when we have the meal with the teacher, you know, we do have discussion, Dharma discussion, of course together. So, um, going back, judging oneself, because that's a big thing. Go through this particular challenge of, challenges of, of your life. Go with a good heart. What does that mean? Don't start being this awful type of Buddhist that's are placarding all these labels before on reality before you even started, you know? Can't do this, is anicca. A lot, lot of people get mistaken by that. They think Buddhism before experiencing the teaching. Eh? They think about it. They don't go and say, they, they don't really, what is missing is the being reminded to be relaxed in oneself to be relaxed. We can't often be like that because we're not surrounded by very safe situation. Often we are frightened that people are going to criticize us. We're frightened by the cultural kind of society's kind of expectations. We are, you know, there's so many things that prevent us from being relaxed with ourselves, at ease, loving towards ourselves, caring towards ourselves, so little chance, except when you come to Marawati, people say they can feel very relaxed here. Because nobody's going to be down, you know, hitting them on the head because they didn't look in the right directions or they ate too much cakes or whatever. You can eat all the cakes you want here. Nobody will bat an eyelid. Unless your neighbors behind you realize the last one is gone and it's not going to get it. <laughs> Just a human, you know, human interaction. So um, what is important is um, not so much falling in love. Falling in love is just a natural, you know, you're hungry, you fall in love because you, you have a need, you know. I mean, the, the falling in love comes from oneself. It's not a feeling that may, you don't need another person to fall in love, you know. It's just, we'll find something. to fall. You know, it's something that we need attention. We need to be recognized. We need, maybe we are unhappy. We need a, somebody who is empathetic towards us. Maybe we lost a, a, a partner or a parents. We feel very uh, full of grief and so on. And there's nothing that will attract a partner as well than you see a man or women full of grief and unhappy. If you really want to have a quick partner, just look for the women who look miserable. <laughs> she might reject you still, but you have more chance, you know. <laughs> Somebody who is really unhappy. You have all your chance, you know. <laughs> I think. I'm not sure, but I think. <laughs> it's the same the other way around, you know. <laughs> so, but as you say, some people say no. no, no. <laughs> yeah, sometimes being happy, you can also fall in love with happy people. <laughs> but I notice that when we need, you know, we feel unworthy or we feel, you know, we, we can't see the good in ourselves. We can see ourselves being a confident person and somebody who is really, um, uh, you know, kind and intelligent and bright and so on, it's easy to want to, you know, have somebody telling us that. So falling in love, they're in love with you and they're not going to tell you, you are an idiot, you know, you're so ugly, I can't stand you. It's more likely they're going to say how gorgeous you are, you know, how wonderful, for at least a few days, you know. <laughs> Mine was a few weeks, if you're lucky. Yeah. 
So it's good to remember that, not to feel too ambitious about the possibility of life. <laughs> and um, I'm not asking to become a monk or a nun to live a peaceful brahmacharya life, but it does help. <laughs> Your mind is really clear and, and, and kind of um, focused on the goal, you know. Yet we have had many monks here, many nuns, you know, who um, I'm sure fell in love often and eventually left the monastery and got married and had partners, have partners now, children and so on, very happy. So uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that when these things happen, we have to be wise to them, not beating oneself up, which probably will drive you in a worst situation. Do you understand? Because if you beat yourself up, then you start feeling awful. You start maybe drinking, taking drugs, doing things that will either annihilate your consciousness or uh, put you to sleep or depressed, you know. So we're not on performance yet. Hello? <laughs> Hello, mister. Hello, gentlemen. We're not performing yet. Can you sit down quietly? That's very good. Without moving anymore? Good. <laughs> and don't move now. That's great. Anyway, so when we observe our experience, whether it's falling in love or any other things, when we are beginning to use the tools that the Buddhist teaching offers us, then we are actually at home. For one thing, we are at home. We're not in a kind of weird dream world, you know, that just kind of drag us into a lot of distractions or imaginations or all kind of bizarre things that we, our mind can concoct, you know, because the mind is pretty, um, you know, powerful, one thing, and also you can think any old things, you know, from being a complete murderer to an angel, you know. That's what we need to know ourselves because, we, uh, uh, you know, with such an instrument like the, the mind, uh, it's really uh, absolutely essential to, to get to know it, you know, and how to get to know the way out of suffering, for one thing. That's one aspect. And not only that, but also to know, have the confidence and realization that it works. Faith, confidence, trust. Use whatever name you want. They're all the same. Right? We can do the Sanskrit as well. Sanskrit, I think, is Shraddha for those ex Tibetan <laughs> uh, students. You know? So, all this is pointing to clarity, is pointing to knowledge, is pointing to insight. And it's pointing to peace, you know, to the peacefulness of our life. Because our mind is our life. You notice that. When our mind is feeling rejected. Because the other, you know, like I haven't spoken yet about the opposite of falling in love, falling out of love. It will be another hour, probably, to really go through that. You know, how to recover from the out of love experience. I think we need another talk for that. Many people come to the monastery and usually and you're miserable, you know. It's a nice place. You can just relax and experience all in love, out love, without anybody bumping into you, telling you you should be this way or that way. You should shake up. Come on, it's a beautiful sunshine today. Wake up, you know. Buddha says. And the Buddha says, you know. you just encouraged to be real. You know, to be uh, yourself. Not a big thing, isn't it? Not have to impress anybody. Not a, the point to impress anybody. That's such a relief, isn't it? The whole world is about trying to impress a bit, you know. We have how many personas just kind of jump up into ourselves, pop up straight away, you know. Trying to become somebody for other people. 
trying to represent oneself in a way that we know doesn't exist anyway. Because at some level, the more you practice, the more you discover there's nobody around anyway. Now, be careful with this one. Don't tell your partner, hi darling, you know, she's angry and really annoyed. There's nobody around, the Buddha says, you know, you don't exist. I said, find out how that works. So you are, this is a truth, there's nobody there for very long, two seconds. But you have to, it's not other people you have to teach, it's yourself. So when somebody's angry with you and you, find, you feel the sense of, you know, I must tell this person that the Buddha said it's all impermanent and satisfactory and not me. When you start feeling that desire to kind of rearrange the, you know, the, the what do you call the, the the chair on the, what is the word? The, the boat, see? Anyway, you know the boat I'm talking about, don't you? And <laughs> rearranging the dock chairs, the deck chairs, yeah. Uh, what is important is as soon as you feel that tendency, that, that pressure in you to want to teach somebody the good Buddhist teaching you know, don't do that. Pull back and teach yourself. What do you need to learn now yourself? Maybe you need to totally accept the anger of this person. That would be Buddhist, very Buddhist, you know. Like you'll be a good Buddhist by being at peace and patient with a person who is having a huge argument with you. You listen carefully, you know, unless they are dangerous, of course, you have to defend yourself. But if they are not, you are, as a person, in front of somebody who is angry, for example, you actually develop a sense of mindfulness, compassion, kindness, and patience. So, what do we do usually? Hmm? You see, even in a family, if you've learned something, you want to teach everybody else, don't you? So today, you had some kind of tips about this falling in love aspect of life. And then you go home and you see your teenagers falling in love with this partner. And you start telling him, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that. Because, you know, I've been told in Buddhism, you know, you have to do this, you have to do that. But the poor teenagers, he doesn't care. She doesn't care. She, she's not there, do you understand? You have to be with people where they are. So if she falls in love with a partner, you've done that 20 years, you know, let that partner, that, that, that poor teenagers, leave, leave that person alone to experience life as it is. If I had, had been a nun, I think I would have opened an institute for dejected teenagers. Because that was an, a very difficult teenager. Teenager's time was a terrible time for me, difficult. I had a good parents. I mean, it's not that I was in the street. No, no, I was not taking drugs. I was not doing any of that. But it's psychologically and emotionally, it's a big kind of change and transformation in oneself. And I can see a lot of teenagers are not really difficult for parents to understand people who are so close to them. Isn't it? My parents were wonderful with all my teenagers' friends. They loved my parents because... They used to say, yeah, go on a revolution, it's good. Yeah, do, follow your heart, follow your bliss. And I follow my heart, follow my bliss. Can I do that? No, 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 you've got to be, a, you know, basically a good girl. So I'm just saying, use this story to, you know, basically it's connected with the sense of imagining a lot of things and actually being pointed toward experience, towards being real. I've said that before, right? not looking for something outside to explain all the misery that you have, even if it is true. I mean, a lot of time it can be true. Of course it is true. If you have obnoxious people around you, it's quite normal that you feel miserable. But to be able to solve the situation, there are many means. You can find the right way to deal with the people outside you. You can find, but also for you to deflect that energy of reactivity towards an unsatisfactory situation is the way to the deepest liberation of habits. Do you understand? Because the world will catch on your habits as long as you react to them. You, know, you will be hooked onto reactions as long as 
inside yourself you have this reaction alive and well and that goes to finish now you know when you fall in love remember check is just is it just a good happy feeling an ecstatic feeling of having find something whatever it is whether it's you know porcupine or handsome men or women beautiful women or a little mouse <laughs> whatever it is notice the mice doesn't care the porcupine doesn't give it i think anything i have to be careful with don't they give anything to, you know? Uh, I have to be careful with my uh, English, because sometimes I can be rude without knowing it. Uh, you don't care, basically. That, per that little animal doesn't care. But with people, it's the same thing. You know, when you fall in love with somebody, it may, you know, you, we can project. I, I, being a woman, I know women much better than men. I don't know about men so much, but women are really good at, you know, we're quite good at projecting a lot of things because we are emotionally quite, we can be easily, um, how can I say, our emotion can be really turned into misery. You know, and so we can be, we can come across as being needy when we're not needy particularly. We just express emotions and what happens is somebody wants to fix you or to make you happy. Do you understand? I'm not saying who, because I don't want to get into trouble with the sex issues, men and female. But you know what I mean? Suddenly, you just have to look a bit like, oh, I can't do it. And then suddenly, somebody comes to your rescue, a kind woman or a kind man, you don't know, you know, to kind of help you out. So if you want to be left alone, be careful how what you project into the, into the air, into the space. Yeah? Watch out a little bit what you what you communicate to the world, in other words. Yeah. So yes, you can fall in love and you are the person perhaps that need even more to follow a spiritual path if a spiritual path is a path of liberation from delusion and stupidity, right? Selfishness, self-centeredness, egoism, whatever you want to call it, egotisticness, and so on, right? At some point, we all realize being selfish and just having the navel of one's body as a, as, a, as a world is not particularly satisfactory, is it? And the navel stands for I, 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 everything around me. The world is all me. Every, every eye that but an eyelid is, must be about me. I still remember the time when I chitter so was an anagarica. We, we all have this experience. But, it's quite sweet just to see the, world, the mind really clearly. The, you know, I had, I had eaten a, bit, a, a, a square of chocolate, which hadn't been offered to me especially when I was just at the beginning of my training in the kitchen at Chitters. I saw a piece of chocolate and I picked it up and eat, ate it. When I arrived up at the main house of Chitters, you know, I entered the room and of course, me being me and the center of my universe, you know, oh, they all know. They all know I have taken a piece of chocolate, you know. That's how it functions. That's I function like that. Until I realized, it took me a few months to realize people don't care about you. They don't care. They don't give a damn about what they've done. They're so busy saying the same thing about themselves and others. Oh my God, they must know I've done this terrible thing, you know. You know, we're so busy with ourselves, nobody really notice you. <laughs> Be reassured, you know. So, continue your path, okay? Fall in love as long as you want, but don't lose your path, so, and that might shorten your dukkha 
of falling in love quickly, because how many times you want to make yourself suffer needlessly, unless you're a masochist, right? And um, learn from that experience. That's the beauty of it. We can learn from that experience. Because, you know, you can use falling in love also in a more poetical way. It's like something that opens your mind. It's like you open something new. But that you haven't seen that it was so dependent with something that didn't even exist that it just collapses really quickly and then you feel this kind of completely... Um, desperate, you know, oh, I've lost my moment, you know, a beautiful moment. Okay, now let's sit for two seconds. <laughs> Ten seconds. This kind of... So, following this ancient tradition, we have 10, 15 minutes break now. I, I heard that the trains were not working from London. Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah? How did you come? <laughs> A tube. And then what? Uh, bus or something? Okay, so tea is ready. I can see our very nice Thai friend who prepares the tea. They just to come and help out with the. And uh, we can just uh, have a break until about quarter past three. And then after that, we have a session of questions and answers. And you're very welcome to stay, especially if you have questions. And I'll meet with you again in about 10 minutes here. Yeah. Hmm? Um, <clears throat> this is a time for question. And um, if you please do not hesitate to ask the question you want. Those who are at the back there, you can come and sit on the chair. There's plenty of chair in the front here. Uh, empty, so don't hesitate, come forward. It's easier for everybody. And who is going to pass the uh, microphone? As we... Okay, that's great. Yeah, come in the front row there. So many places empty. Yeah, it's not... So... <clears throat> There's some places here at the front, and a second, third row, fourth row. So, any questions? It's interesting. When you're in America, it's like... <laughs> Here, I think in England, I always get the feeling people are waiting for other people to ask a question. They love to ask, but maybe they're too, sh too shy to ask. 
Well, if you don't have any question, we can just close shop then. Yeah, what question? Um, how should my uh, how parents help me? Uh, oh, it's, it's hard. I mean, how to make our parents happy? Because they have expecting on the uh, sons and kids. Um, but we also have our life. So when they want us to follow, follow them. But I don't want to follow, but they are not happy. So how, how to make them happy? And at the same time, I have my life. Okay. That's not an easy question, you know. Um, this I lady is from China. Are you Chinese? Yes, I am. That's right. And so in Asia, you know, China or Thailand, you know. But China, I know a few students from China who have been here. And uh, we all know, I shouldn't say that maybe on a, on, a, on a video, but no, I'm not going to say it then. <laughs> oh, we may be misunderstood, you see. I was going to talk about... No, I shouldn't say <laughs> really tempted, you see, I had to kind of pull back. So, um, it's a question that really has no answer. I've seen people in your situation a number of times, you know. How to make people happy and do what I want, that's really what your question is about, you know. I to, how to make my, mom and my, my, my mother and my father, father happy in the expectation they have towards me, for me, and how can at the same time do what I like to do with my life? Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So it's not that easy. What they want for you is very different from what you want for yourself. Are you sure? Um, I don't know. Maybe. You're just frightened. They might be, might not be the same, eh? Yeah. They might want you to be back in China and work really hard. Uh, yes, they want to take me close, but I don't want. They want to give you a job. No, they they want me uh, close to them, but I don't yeah, want. Yeah, that's to. right. It's a big thing in this kind of global village, isn't it? It's a big problem. Because um, many people don't live at home anymore, or even the same country, not to mention the same continent. You know, with this kind of thing, I think it's important to... Um, you know, there's nothing... Do you want some tissues? Don't we have any tissues? Thank you, Yunkyu, yeah. So, if it was me, I don't know, maybe I've become a little wiser to life now. If it was, if I was in your position, I would observe my mind worrying about this, and as you worry, you almost go into a self, um, uh, you know, you, you materialize your fear if you're not careful. Which means the thing that you fear will come because you haven't seen clearly that your mind is projecting fear outside itself. The most important thing to change your life is not to create it in the first place. And we create our world through being frightened of it, anticipating it in a way that we would hope it happens, and then fearing that it might not happen. You know, because your mind is not free yet, you are creating reality upon reality that never happened yet. 
So I do believe in the way of kindness, you know, like your mom, you can, your parents, you can, they can, you can give them a sense that you hear what they are saying, but you don't have to stay straight away, but, and I agree with you. You don't have to say that. You can hear what they're saying, and, but you don't know, what, you could be dead the next day. I mean, why would you want to bog down yourself, bog yourself down? You know, trying to find out what you're going to do in your future instead of taking care of the present moment, which will be your future eventually. Make sense? Yeah. So you take, uh, you take example to, you know, on your friends who come into retreat now, learn how to meditate, you know, learn really the skill of meditation so you can see what your mind creates. If you don't see what your mind creates, it will create itself anyway, but you just will create maybe the thing you don't want to have in your life, you know? You know, you can, you, it's easy to go in the self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, by thinking about it all the time. Don't expect your parents not to be upset if you do something they don't want. They're not saints, are they? They are not saints. But what you can do is just leave one moment to the next with a peaceful and happy heart. And then that will create the future for a peaceful and happy situation, you know, if you are, you know, mindful and awake. Because at some point you might find yourself close to your family and not mind at all. If you've been wise, to your mind. Do you understand? Yeah. Everything might change in you, not because you're frightened of your parents, but because you're attuned with reality of your situation. So observe your fear when this comes up, you know, the desire to make your parents happy and the horror, horrible conflict that comes, but I won't be able to. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah. Good. Thank you. Mm. Uh, I like to know when we died. Co co bring it a little closer. When we died, our body is disposed of. So what happened to the mind? Oh, the mind. Oh. <laughs> That's a big question. It is. It is. I don't know. <laughs> you would expect me to know, wouldn't you? All I know, all I know, I and I do have an enormous faith and confidence in that, even though I don't have a clue whether that can happen or not. But I do feel really good to have confidence in what the Buddha says. Um, you know, if you, if you do good, you're more likely to have a good place for your mind. And if you do terrible things, I mean, we learn from the Buddhist teaching that cause and effect have, you know, can happen from maybe one life to another. So we, we, we learn, I mean, the teaching is that we learn how to see what we do to, and to wisely uh, assess whether what we're doing is going to have unfortunate consequences or fortunate ones. And then, you know, from that place, we continue to direct our life until we die. We die. Mm. And then after we die... I just want to tell you the truth. Nobody has ever come back to tell me where they are. Exactly. exactly. But according I wish to, they would, but... But according to Buddhism, yeah. I understand that the soul may go either to a good well, place or to the... Well, do you know one thing... But, yeah. but some people... Just die suddenly. Yes. Without warning, without anything. Yeah. You cross the road, you were killed. Like Grenfell, Grenfell Tower, for example. Yeah. They yeah. were not expected to die, did they? So, what happened to those souls? 
I've asked this question to myself occasionally. I haven't found an answer. So I decided to stay simple. To, you know, the mind needs to be trained. It's a naughty, it's a naughty entity there. Asking questions that has no answer, you know. So I, I, I decided to train my mind with my story. I say, okay, you want me to know? Well, I don't know. I don't know what will happen, you know. But I'm really happy to live this life and make a difference in my life, you understand? Yeah. So what happened to people who died suddenly? We have also to come to the place in ourselves that maybe we won't know, but we can just carry on doing good and being a kind person. And what, what about the young, we are dull, we made deeds, and good deeds and bad deeds, but yeah. what happened to young children who haven't, done anything and they happen to die suddenly. When I tell you they have done so little bad deeds that they are in a much better place than most adults <laughs> compared to the, the amount of unskillful behavior, action and speech that an adult life has committed, the kids are probably in heaven quite quickly, I think, unless their karma catches up with them, we don't know, you know, whether karma bank accounts, you know, will take them, I have no idea. But um, this question, I, I, I would encourage you to um, not worry too much about things you cannot know, but do all the things you know. And for, for example, to make peace with the fact that some of the relatives in your family have had a quite brutal death, you know, or a sudden death, you know. And it's a question that naturally comes, you know, um, I'm quite, you know, at some point you realize that we're not as separate as you think, you know. We don't know, you know. But what, what can we do to help those souls who were not prepared to death? I, I would consider that, if I, if I listen to my mind saying that, I will call it straight away worry. Worry, you worry. I am. That's right. So worry is anicca dukkha anatta. It's not something we need to worry about. No need to worry about worry. But that's the truth. You are worried about what happened after death. Now, you can take care of the worry, you know, by using the Buddhist teaching. And once you stop worrying, your mind may be in a very different place, you understand? When you worry, you are in a miserable place, you know, because you worry about wanting a, a response to something that doesn't have one satisfactory. Nobody has ever said to anyone in this room, I think, you know, even the mystics and all the people turning table and all that, you know. I'm sure there's plenty of, uh, of things that one can know, but know for certain, I don't think so. The world is a, the, the universe is, seems pretty vast to me and what happened after death is beyond my capacity to know, unless I was a Buddha, maybe. Buddha seemed to know exactly what people were reborn and so on. So, not being a Buddha, I think we can leave the question as saying, we don't know. But in your life, you can dedicate the blessings of your life to those people who are departed, you know. And that makes your heart happy, doesn't it? All the good and kind thoughts, all the good and kind actions, and all the good and kind speech about them makes your heart happy and, you know, joyful. Um, yeah? In um, Buddhism, I heard about the reincarnation. Yeah, we, yeah. Well, what reincarnate, we don't use, actually, in the forest tradition, we don't use so much the word reincarnation as rebirth. And uh, Ajahn Shah, the teacher, my teacher, who was a, a wisdom teacher, um, always uh, brought, brought the Dhamma back to where it can be handled, you know, not struggling with, you know, a worried mind about what happened after death is one thing, and then 
Another way of looking at it, he would say, what you were thinking a minute ago, that's your past. What you think now, it's your future. It's what's happening now, okay? And what would happen next is your future. Because at a certain level, things work like that. You know, we're not so limited by the physical body, I don't think. I did read when I was a young novice, I remember, a book of letters between two Christian nuns. They have been really, really good friends. And it was such an exciting book about wanting to know. It's really exciting. So the one who died, she was telling him, telling her, she was channeling her and receiving all these letters, you know, to channeling. And she was basically saying, do you know, it's just like back on Earth, we have a hospital and a police station and then prison, and then we look after the sick and we do this and that, and everything is fine for me, I'm quite happy, da 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 I'm sure this book is still exists and uh, you can buy it, you know. It seemed to be, uh, you know, interesting, there's not that much difference, you know. On another hand, you know, the Buddha talks about the, uh, you know, the several, you know, tens and tens of uh, heavenly realm, heavenly realm you can be reborn into, and then you have the hungry ghost and the hell realm and the human realm and the animal realms on the below, you know. Then you have the human realm in the middle of the divine realm and the hell realm. You know. At some point, we are very concerned about ourselves, but I got a very strong feeling that by the time we die, things will be very different. Like what? what? Don't ask me, I'm still around. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still around, you know. I think, I tell you what, I think we can pose on that question now, okay? <laughs> and maybe someone else might have to, would like to bring another topic. Shall we do that? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you pass to, yeah. Uh, I just want to ask if you feel depressed, how you deal with your depressing mind? Say that again. If you have depressing feeling, depressed mind, how are you dealing with that? <laughs> well, one of the things, uh, that is important is to have a full awareness of this mind that is depressed. This means that through meditation, through practice, you begin to see the difference between being completely stuck, sucked in depression or seeing the feeling of depression, the state of depression, you objectify yourself, do you understand? To be able to observe and objectify that feeling. Right? That's the beginning, just to be able to see when you are depressed and to see when you're not. You're not depressed all the time, are you? Well, you were laughing with me yesterday or two days ago, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I know you're not depressed all the time. It's just that I feel I feel angry or happy. What? It feels like angry or happy. Has she got a microphone? Yeah, we've got a microphone. People want to hear you at the back as well. It just feels strangely headache or, or angry, not allowed to express at all. That's right. So you know that, don't you? And now, there's no secret and no magic on these things. It's just hard work, you know, the work of being patient with those feelings, making peace with those feelings until the clouds disperse. Right? I have actually helped somebody very close to me who was suffering from depression. depression. And this person has two other people helping him. Someday in my family. And, you know, it's important to know the mind that is not caught up in depression. The mind that sees depression is not caught up, is not identified with depression. Do you understand? So this is important to give this mind a lot of strength. 
It's not a mind that is disconnected from depression. It's just that we all have an amazing thing in ourselves. It's the fact this is this thing is the mirror. We can actually mirror our reality. Hmm? When you are aware, you are with a mirror of your mind. And as you mirror, you see the, the object in the mirror. That can be your body hurting, your mind having a migraine. It can be a feeling of despair and jo or joy. You have this mirror that can observe. That's called the observer. That can see. And if you're depressed, you can't expect yourself to be joyful. That would be asking an awful lot from a mind that just goes down into depression. But what you can do is learn through your meditation practice to see clearly anicca, impermanence. If you see the, the experience of your depression clearly, you will notice also, also it has an end. When you see it coming back, you can recognize it's back again. And then, if you can do this, it will be very important to notice what it feels like, examine it, explore it, know it well. And then it ends at some point again. Sometime when we don't have any objectives, sometime when we don't have any kind of clear intention in our mind to do something or to, we can easily get fuzzy and lost and go down into depression because the mind has nothing to hang on to, you know? So it's good that when you have the sense of the feeling of depression to develop energy and energy and depression are opposite, you know? When you're depressed, you go down, you don't feel interested anymore, you're upset, you can't see any point in living, and all kinds of things, you know. Not just killing oneself, just a day, you know. It's like there's nothing to the day that really interesting, whatever it is. So as a depressed person, it's actually quite good to get help. The person I helped had also help support, you know going to a clinic where there is people have trouble, not necessarily depression, but other things, you know. Just a support system. Where you can be out of your normal kind of conditioning and habits and places, I mean, in your situation particularly, you can come out of this. Yeah? You're, you notice depression is also, as everything else in our experience, changing, not me, not mine, and painful. So, okay? Patience, big patience. And good friend. Yeah. Go, we, we, do we get the microphone? So. So speak quite loud. Hello. Um, when love turns into hate, and uh, when you have more bitter feelings for a person, um, <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is that uh, you listen to Dhamma talks, you try to practice meditation, you try to watch your thoughts and everything. Sometimes those watching the thoughts can turn into strong thinking. And, uh, can we can we When you're watching the thoughts, yeah, can turn into a strong thinking if you're not very skillful enough. Uh -huh. So when the strong thinking comes and when the emotion of hate uh, gets attached to it, you know, your mind works very strongly and uh, you don't even imagine <coughs> uh, these kind of thoughts are going through your mind. So my question is that uh, what happens when you're trying to observe your thoughts and when you go into deep thinking you know, how to uh, demarcate that line and uh, have much more control over your practice, if I'm making sense. Yeah, it makes total sense. You know, if you sit down in meditation, you say, I'm just going to observe my thought for an hour, and that's it. Don't get engaged with your thought. It's a big difference between 
observing your thoughts and engaging with your thinking. So you have to know the difference. Yeah, that's, uh, I'm struggling a bit because I'm a bit of well, a beginner. Yeah. Well, well, you're struggling, but that's work. You know, that's what you have to do. You, you don't have to struggle, you see. Because, you, you, you know, in a way, we have a hard time, you know, spending too much time losing control of our thoughts. Do you understand? We, wa we don't want just to see, like, and she, or car, the garage. Nice day. You've got that. At some point we say, well, what is the meaning of life? You know, you, might, you know. You don't want to go into one thought and then space and another thought space and it leads nowhere. It doesn't feel like it's going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. That's why we remind people it's not going anywhere. So you want to be, come back to be an intelligent man, you see? They have to think for themselves. Yeah. So, watch the feeling behind it. That would be interesting, you know? The desire to come, the desire to come back to the comfort of being in charge. The thoughts are not a problem, the feeling behind it, you know? The fear of losing that sense of being in charge. Makes sense? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Is somebody here? Um, when you're in a point where you uh, want to make a decision to change, make a relevant change in your life. Um, how do you make sure that that desire to make that change comes from a balanced place and it's not influenced by, you know, fear or notions about how you should live your life? Or how do you make sure that you verify um, that thought before, you know, putting it into action? Do you want how to verify where this desire for change come from? Yeah, and if it's really what you want to do, and if it's exactly what <laughs> you should be doing, if if that's a notion of you know what you should be doing, if that's well, really you know, do you know any about how much can we know the future? Well, you know, but you don't. But um, usually, after you make that change and things settle down, you can realize you know whether and analyze whether it was a good decision or not, or or what you can learn from it. But um, initially, when it's the the change is you know it really begins, it's quite cha chaotic and it's not as easy to to analyze or see clearly. Do you know? Uh, I remember a very wise teacher saying to me that when he doesn't know what what to do in situation, let's say, okay, he just puts forward an intention, which is good intention and then go for it, he has no idea. He said, I don't know why, whether this would be right or wrong. But he's just set up an intention and then, whether it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's true for everything, I think, you know. I find that, you know, you set up an intention with a clear intention that you want to do good, refrain from doing evil and, you know, let go of what's unskillful and so on. Uh, you find that at every turning of life, you know, even just being with people, you know, shall I meet them, not meet them, or, you know, shall I invite them to do this, how can I know them better, or, you know, like the Anagarika, or, uh, you know, shall I have a meeting with them, or not meeting, or shall I have a meeting, I mean, it's all kind of thing, you know, you can... So, for you, it's important that you um, make your intention clear, and the future is unknown. <laughs> it's true, do you know what I mean? The future is unknown. It's not like a nice Zen thing, you know. It's the past is a memory, as Ajahn Sumedho's teaching goes. Now is a knowing. Now you know that you are worried about the future, maybe, what to do. And the future is unknown. Which means you have to be really count on each moment to make the next step. Do you understand? Yeah. You have to be much more mindful of each moment to be able to inform the next moment and the next moment and so on. You want to kind of just jump for 10 years now, tell me that it will work forever, you know, 10 years. But as Ajahn Shah often said, just be like an earthworm, you know, just keep going. Slowly, but surely. Any more questions? I have a question.
question that uh, my son, he, we, we always encourage him to be quiet, calm, calm, peaceful, don't go, don't fight with boys like that. Don't fight with each other? Yes. Yeah. So when he started his nursery, he got beaten. <laughs> when you fight, there's confusion. And then he, he, was, he was in a confusion and also he had a nightmare. But what I said, okay, when, when the boys are coming and beating you, mm -hmm. just go away. Don't, don't hit them back, just go away. So now he's going to start his school. And I had to, um, we actually um, had some one-to-one -one sessions with the nursery. So then You have what? One-to-one. Can you one. close the window a bit because it's too loud for me at the back. I can hear the sound of your hand. So we talked with the nursery and yeah. with the nursery, and we worked together. Yeah. So uh, with the help of them, we actually came to a settled situation, and mm -hmm. then he finally he get on, got on with his friends, and he was he mm -hmm. was okay. Mm -hmm. Now he's starting his schools in September. Now I'm in the same uh, situation with that question. Okay, what will happen now? So what should I, um, uh, what will be the direction or what will be the answer for a little mind? What should I say to him to make him not confused and uh, not upset? You know, I didn't hear everything you said, but anyway, it's fine. If you can resume it in one sentence, that would be helpful for me. So my son, he's so little at the moment. When he got beaten up by someone else, by a child or children, how should I make up his mind? Uh, because I always encourage him to go away, not to beat them back or just go away, don't yeah, get into him. the... F yeah. So now he's starting his schools. So now I have a question, how to, how to make him aware or how to um, mm. make him ready? Well, it's not easy, is it? Oh, <laughs> you know we're talking about you, don't you? Well, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not an, a question I can answer right away, you know. I mean, in a way, children, all I can see, I mean, if, if I'm really, if I was a mother now, I always tend to think love is the only way, you know. You know, you don't know what happened in his life, you know. Yeah. Why is he so, you know, I used to be a very agitated child myself, you know, so I have natural compassion for the difficult kids because I used to be very boisterous, you know, very kind of energetic and so on. So sometimes just helping to calm them down, you know, you don't know the energy, what's going on, you know, what makes them so restless and so on. But it responds quite well, I think... Um, has you always been like that? Have you always been like that? Yeah? Hello? <laughs> I think it's probably best if we talked at another time. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah? yeah? That's right. So, shall we, we can, we can talk about it another time. Any other questions? No, I tell you what. Hey, wait, wait a minute. Ask him to bring the the microphone to the person himself. You're going to be the microphone person now, eh? Huh? Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, so, uh, coming back to the topic of your conversation, um, 
if I understood. You mean that when we fall in love, this uh, sort of blossoming that we feel inside, it's, uh, we are generating it. We're enjoying it, yeah. We are generating it. We're generating it. Yeah, and the person is just uh, triggering it. Is it? Like we choose a person, not yeah. consciously, yeah. but we choose a person which opens something and let us experience this uh, blossoming within us. Well, your, your blossoming is your, your reactions. Yeah. Is you trigger it. Yeah, true. You don't have to believe me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah? <laughs> so what is your question? What is your question? So my question is uh, um, how to... Because even if uh, I can understand this, still there is an attachment to the person. Yeah. Maybe so. because... Uh, yeah, the knowledge is not, uh, it's not yeah. clear. Indeed. Indeed, it's not yeah. clear, yeah. So how do you think I can help you with that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I answer questions. I don't fix people, usually. <laughs> What's your questions? Maybe it was not a question, actually. Uh -huh. Maybe question. it was not a question, actually. You're just telling me what it is, yeah, how it is for you. Yeah. Yeah. So one should just observe better, no? Should just uh, observe better what happens and... Uh, well, it's, it's good. It's, you know, awareness always benefits everything, you know. When you're aware of what's happening in you, not obsessively and trying to... Just how you are affected by life, you know? Just, just notice the effect of life onto you. You don't need to kind of, you know, uh, obsess your mind or um, stress your mind with the whys and the why not and so on. Just notice, you know, is this real? Is this not real? Or is this, you know, notice the thing that you create if the person, for example, is not responding to you. And if the person is responding? Notice what happened then. <laughs> and then after that, you know, they might be happy ever after, I don't know. <laughs> That's right, I don't, I, don't, I don't divine the future, I don't have any crystal ball, you know. It's a pity. <laughs> eh? It's a pity, yeah. thank you. Yeah, okay. I have a question, but uh, I'm not sure it's uh, perfectly clear. My question is um, to observe <laughs> and not to react. I understand that, uh, to observe feeling. Uh, but uh, I would like to know when contemplation must end and when do we go to action and react? Because to be contemplative and just to observe feeling and, <coughs> and things like that, so you start to just look life pass in front of you and you never react yes, when sir. you can start to go into things and say, okay, right now there is something to do. This is unacceptable or things like that. It has a name. Oh, really? The engine has a name, yeah. It's called wisdom. <laughs> the wisdom factor, you know? It's like the capacity to observe, assess the situation, and say, nice, that needs to be done, you know. It hasn't got a recipe, though. You can't know in advance. Wisdom is what needs to, what knows what needs to be done at any given moment, you know. But the wisdom comes together with experience, you know. So if you have no experience, maybe you make many mistakes before you get the result of wisdom. Do you understand? So sometimes you, you know, you don't, you don't say to yourself, I must not react. Although that can be a skillful means. Like it's like an advertisement, you know, be careful. It's much more important to notice what reaction you have, you know. 
well, then they label it, don't react. What is it that you are, what's, what's a reaction? Okay. Do you understand? Before to slam it with a, yeah. with a Buddhist teaching, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not Buddhist, don't do that. Okay, that's clear. No, no guess to, to have wisdom easily, or you say it's experience and it takes time. It's just like that. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. You can make lots of mistakes and forgive yourself and tell yourself, you know, I'm just a beginner. I'm just kind of beginning again, beginning again, beginning again. Say, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. Well, I'm sorry. You can always ask to say sorry. You know, don't have to kind of uh, destroy your own confidence because you are not perfect for somebody else, you know. It's important. Keep your confidence on oh. the path. Yeah, sure. Thank you for that. Somebody behind you. Is it not? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, I have a question, and um, I was getting to the point where um, when I'm, I'm sitting in meditation, or I'm, for example, I'm, I'm walking meditation, that I notice that um, I can be aware that when I, for example, see something that my consciousness or my mind is often like trying to, um, yeah, fill it in, like, because the mind, I think, is only just the experience and it tries to put it on and, and uh, identifies with it and creates a future. And, and I can somehow can see that relationship and then somehow I, um, I can see where that comes from or I can see a picture or something and I can stay with it and with the feeling. But then it, it's like always the same, like, and it comes on again and again, and, and I don't react to it. Um, so I have the feeling like I, I'm getting more distance to it, like I can be aware with it, but the the picture or the the memory or something, my mind is connecting to it. This makes it trying to make it subjective, like creating that I experience somehow from mm -hmm. the past is. Is still like the still there, and I was wondering if by staying with it and letting that picture come, although I don't react to it, if that doesn't um, create it more in the pattern of consciousness, is that understandable? Wars, wars or war? More, more things. Like for example, when I. Ah, oh. okay, I make something. I, I, I see a bar of chocolate and I somehow in my past um, have this uh, a desire or aversion against it. And desire I, or aversion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I have somehow a memory I connect it with that my uh, consciousness is projecting when I see it. That kind of makes me, gets that thrive to... Mm -hmm. Yeah, to do it again, to relive somehow the past, yeah, and yeah. I can see that, and I don't react. And from the feeling, it's neutral, but that picture is coming. It's still, it's still coming and coming. I don't react to it, and I was wondering if, um, because that picture is still coming, is it then not like getting more and more solid in? No, you know, it's not because you're aware that things are not going to come back, you know. Yeah. It takes a lot more for the mind not to drag its old stories, you know. Mm. So if you, for example, your chocolate thing, you know, you, you, you see that, oh, in the past you want to, you wanted chocolate and you were averse to chocolate and all that kind of, you know, zigzaggy feeling you have, I want, I don't want, it's terrible, I should, you know, etc. You know... <clears throat> Don't engage with your mind. That's the best way. Don't try to ca do figure out your mind. It's a liar. Yeah. Not just your mind. Everybody's mind is a liar. It lies to you all the time. Just tell you stories that don't exist. It forgets stories that exist. 
It tells you things that never happened, will never happen, and tells you stories that's happening right now when it isn't, you know. So what I mean is that don't engage with your mind. Let your mind do what it wants to do. Bring back this and the chocolate and the chocolate. You didn't do the chocolate, chocolate, you know, what I kind of say. Just let it come back until it ends. It runs out of fuel. You know, it runs out of fuel. And then it, the, the, you need to realize that everything that appears in your mind is, con, is actually uh, conditioned by something. It's been caused by something. And the thing that's caused it has uh, it's also an end. It's also impermanent. Do you understand? Yeah. It's also impermanent. So because of that, you will see the end. The most important things in our life is to see that things are beginning, have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Once you see that things end, you will find that your fear world will decrease enormously because the fear world has to do with you feeling you're stuck with something and you'll never get off it, you know. You're stuck with your parents' agenda and you feel you never will happen. What you want will never happen. You don't know. One of the most helpful, skillful kind of, um, you know, skillful means that Achen Sumedo gave me and us, you know, the community, is that basically don't know mine. I don't know the future. Why do you want to create something that hasn't happened yet? Why do you want to create the thing that's going on in your mind with having a little kind of a record story behind next to it, parallel with it? Just let it be. Just let it go as it is. Don't engage. Like Ajahn Shah, use the image of Ajahn Shah who said, you know, a cobra will slide next to you. Don't touch it. If you don't touch it, it will not harm you. If you touch it, it will kill you. That was an image, you know, for the mind. Don't touch it, because if you touch it, the mind has a great power to, you know, to create, to cause suffering. Through confusion, through doubts, through worries, through anxiety, restlessness, desire for things that are pleasant, anger, frustration, envy, the whole lot, you know. Don't touch it. Have faith, have confidence, you know. Then come to the point where you see the end. When you see the end, then you have the confidence. You've seen it once. Then they give you, the, okay, it's impermanent. That's very deep knowledge already. Do you understand? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ajahn. So following the chocolate example... <clears throat> and sometimes I feel that the desires, strong desires or repeatable desires um, are a mean to reflect something. And so I, I do try to track the cause of them, what's caused them to arise and not just not touching them because... Um, Maybe it points to some deeper di kilesas or something like that. Or s some emotional thing that is related. So maybe if you can talk about this, because as you said now, like not to touch it, it's a different um, approach. Mm -hmm. You know... I think one of the ways for me, what has worked for myself, is like every time I move with something, I've never felt it the right way, eventually, confidently. You know? What you call the deeper kinesa is the emotional world, huh? Yeah? Can be. Yeah. yeah. M most things are actually caused by feeling. Okay? Vedana. Most of our action begin with feelings. Uh, when you, some of you who have studied the Paticca Samuppada, the law of dependent origination, on one of the 12 links of explaining 
the arising of dukkha and the ending of dukkha, right? The arising of dukkha, without going from consciousness and all that, we can start with the sense consciousness, you know, the ears, eyes, nose, tongue, body, and mind, right? Conditions the um, sense object, the corresponding sense object, yes? And the sense object condition, you know, the contact with that condition, um, Vedana. And from Vedana, we have Tanha, okay? It means clinging and grasping. And that's when we cling and we grasp that we begin to have the low, the whole uh, process of suffering arising right to the end. It means that what arises is uh, desire and then clinging, grasping, and then the becoming, and then birth, old age, sickness, death, lamentation, grief, and despair. So the, the first noble truth, you know. But everything starts moving from the point where you feel something and it hasn't been clearly acknowledged, and then things start moving, you know, down to despair. So if you can catch the feelings, then you have caught the mind at a very deep level before it gets reborn into suffering. Yeah? So, but often we don't always caught the feelings because the feeling, we are so much you know, kind of swimming into thought, you know, thought world, that we ignore the feeling underneath, you know. Like I said to this gentleman who was there at the first, uh, at the beginning, there was a, somebody asked me a question about, you know, the meditation, and then we, we, we watch, you know, the thoughts, and then, then I engage into the thinking instead of watching the thought. But I said, what is the feeling behind that? You know, do you want to, are you frightened to lose control, or... You know, are you fed up just to be in a place where you just see your thoughts, you know? Tuesday, Helen, didn't go to the toilet. Closed door, me, dog, I, perhaps, try me nuts. You know, it's like the, out, the world out of control, but it's the world how it is most of the time. Do you understand? <laughs> and then you say, well, I think, you know, after all, you know, all these things, I've got a good opinion on that, you know. Well, I think maybe, you know, Helen should really go and work, you know, and uh, forgotten to go to the toilet this morning. But, you know, it's like back to the sentence, you know, proper sentence of the verb and the noun and, and uh, compl compliment, you know. Yeah. Is that enough for you? Yeah. Okay. One more. Because some people, I think, want to go. Yeah. Okay. Hi, thanks. Um, in the aftermath of an event that kind of changes your perception of who you are and of you. Hang on, uh, can you stand up? The aftermath of what? Of something that changes who you are and how you view humanity. How do you deal with a kind of loss of self and a kind of... Sorry, you deal with? A loss of self and, yeah, mm -hmm. and not understanding who this new person is. Come here. I, I, it's not that clear. I don't want to talk, go into a discussion about something that I don't hear from. Very well. Um, you can sit just, here. You can sit here. It's okay. okay. I was just wondering, in the aftermath of an event that is um, that makes you lose your sense of self and um, what you knew about humanity, and it changes your perceptions, how do you deal with that loss of self? Mm, just and, think yeah. of human. They're all mad. <laughs> You're all mad. You only we 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 just semi-normal because we have the law, you know. I mean, to be a good human being, it takes hard work, you know. Most people are not that balanced. If we have a lot of expectation on people, you know, once you know yourself, you have no no doubt about what I said, you know. It's like once you know yourself, I tell you, 
our reactions are pretty out of control a lot of the time, you know. So maybe your expectation of mankind just been sabotaged. That's what it is, isn't it? So what do I, how do I deal with that? And how do you... I go onto the Noble Eightfold Path and deepen my knowledge of humanity madness called ignorance. It's called avidya, ignorance. Okay. <laughs> you know, what else can you... You can just deal with your own feeling with these things. You deal with your own feeling. Maybe despair, maybe you feel really disappointed, maybe you hate their guts, you know, because they are so promising and now there they are, you know, did me in. And then, uh, you know, and then they accuse me as well, you know, I'm that, I'm, I'm there. it's my fault, not their fault, you know. So that's what I mean by mad, you know, we project, counter projection, projection, and then we get into a completely crazy, you know, kind of embroglio with each other. Mm. It's difficult to get out of sometimes, you know. Shh, 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 at least okay. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, it's finished. Okay. Hey. Yeah. Hey, the microphone gentleman. Where is he? He's having a good snooze. Yeah. So, well, if we don't have any more questions, you know, pertinent or non-pertinent, one question. Come a little closer, you know, so you can. Hello, hi Sadhu. Um, I'm, this is a question about my relationship. Um, I'm in love with somebody who I believe is standing in my back alley with a dog, um, the alleyway behind my house. Um, but I am unable to get through to him on the phone or um, at the place where he works where I met him. But I have a strong sense that he is the person who's standing in the alley with the dog. And um, he sometimes, I mean, he's receiving messages from me, but, and um, we're communicating through calls, but I haven't had any verbal or physical correspondence with him for a few months. And I don't have the key to the door to the back of the house to go confirm whether it is him or not. Um, I was wondering, but I, you know, I miss him a lot and I want to get in touch with him. So I was wondering what your advice about that situation would be. Sorry. <laughs> I think maybe we can talk about it personally, maybe a bit more, you know, I'm, I, you know, I okay, don't have a lot of recipe for life. Yeah. I just tend to think, um, from what you describe, it's pretty complex, isn't it? <laughs> it's quite, yeah, well, I'm unable to keep in contact with him, but um, I'm in love with him, and I feel his... Shh. No comment. <laughs> no <laughs> um, comment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I would revise my feeling regarding him, if I were you. Sorry, I didn't... I would revise my feeling towards this person regarding this person, you know? Okay. Um, Is he making you happy? Um, which person? The person who made the comment or the, no. the guy who I'm in love with? <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, that's maybe the beginning of your life travel, you see. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I think I get distracted quite a lot by um, outside influences, but um, the guy who... Um, is standing outside my ha behind my house. Um, I'm in love with him and I'm happy being in love with him, but I would like to have a relationship that involves seeing each other and, well, you know, keeping in contact more than... Um, well, but you can't force anybody. People are free, do you understand? Yeah. So um, don't force anybody, it's dangerous. I don't really know how to force him, to be honest. Um, like <laughs> they don't try they don't try forget about yeah. it then. forget about it yeah 
so, um, well, I mean, I'm in love with him and we're spiritually connected, so... Are you sure that you feel the same about you? Um, I have no... I feel it, yeah. I feel that he yeah. does. Well, yeah. we've got to... We, we, I'll teach you how to look at feelings then. <laughs> so, um, is your advice not to... Um, investigate this relationship or... Uh, investigate the feelings. Investigate my feelings. They are not yours and from the point of view of Buddhism they don't belong to you. Okay. They are unsatisfactory and they are impermanent. Okay. A lot to take in, isn't it? There's a lot to take in at once, you know, but you can just see they are impermanent already. I think you need to be freed from that uh, situation, inner situation you got yourself into, you know? You need to free yourself from that. Just have a whole agenda, but somebody is not really nice with you. Yeah. So why do you want to self-torture yourself? <laughs> um, I, yeah, I don't really see it as impermanent, and um, I don't feel torture as in the love I feel for him is joyous. Mm. Um, it's just the fact that I'm in quite a difficult situation mm. at home and I s look for help from him and I don't receive that. Yeah, so maybe it's time sense. to give up, you know. I tell you what, most people here have been stating for nearly two hours mm -hmm. here and many of the questions that they wanted to ask has is, is been done. So maybe if you want, we can have a chat that would be lovely. Another time today or another time about your situation. Okay, yeah. Yeah? But, yeah and then we can just sit down quietly. Thank you so much. We're already 20 minutes that. late, so Thank some you. of you have to do things also. Yeah? Thank you. Close your eyes gently and... Uh, So, I will stay for a few more minutes if people want to have a chat or something. Yeah.